So yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm Will Armour, like uh, Magnus said. Uh, but I, as a public service announcement, before any Postgres talk I give, I tell everyone you should add this to your PSQL RC file. It's set on error rollback interactive. What this will do when you start a transaction, it will automatically save point before everything you type in. So let's say, I don't know who would do this, but you run maybe a five hour migration, and then you type select from instead of select from, it won't blow everything away. I'm not speaking from maybe experience, but uh, this uh, in, impossible to find setting will uh, do it, and only do it for interactive mode. So if you were piping a script to PSQL, it won't turn that on. So this should be the default. It's not. You should set it, make it default. But secondly, I'm super excited. Postgres 19, the very best feature, which no one ever mentions, is you can X auto. And so instead of running a command and finding an impossible read, having to type slash X and then rerun it, slash X auto will just pick the one that you can read and use that. Command. Uh, so yeah, so I work at Heroku on the Heroku Postgres team, and um, who's familiar with what we do at Heroku? Okay, so um, one of the, so that wasn't a whole lot. So what we do is, the main part of Heroku is running web applications for people. And as part of that, we need to, you know, people needed a data store. And so we decided that the best data store that we could give people was Postgres. And so every application on Heroku gets a Postgres database by default. And uh, this has been you know, great for the adoption of Postgres. And as part of this, we need um, And so I have a you know, confession to make. I'm primarily an application developer. I didn't really know much about Postgres before joining Heroku. And I'm curious here uh, about the split between application developers and people who would maybe describe themselves as DBA. So who would consider himself a DBA and not Okay, so that's a lot. Uh, and with the rest application? Okay. Um, so I come from the application yeah. side. Uh, and when I started development, you know, I started with PHP and MySQL, and my application sort of looked like this. Uh, you know, I just had random uh, you know, SQL code inside templating code, and it was, you know, just a mess. Um, and then I found Ruby on Rails and Active Record, and this blew my mind. Like, I could start thinking about my application in the relationships that my models had with each other, and not necessarily the tables that they were represented by. You know, freed, freed me from you know, having to write SQL that you know, like, was repetitive. I could still write SQL that was necessary, but the repetitive sort of just you know, common joins between my table, it took care of that and made things so much faster to build applications. But one of the problems is I still had to deal with migrations. And migrations aren't you know, super hard. But it still is a lot of uh, mental oversight. You know, I have to run it locally. I have to run it for tests. I have to run it on my staging. I have to run it on production. And that's a lot of steps just when I want to do something small. And so when I built my startup before coming to Heroku, uh, that's when CouchDB started getting popular. And you know, I wanted to give it a try, mostly because it was new and fun to try. But it was really a good fit for what I wanted to do. Uh, the main Part about, like, CouchDB has a lot of good features, but the main thing that drew me to it when I went to Couch was the schemaless nature, where I could have sort of semi structured data. I could have my data look more like how I dealt with it in my code and sort of just let the database just store it as was. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's easy to, you know, sort of poo poo some of these you NoSQL know, databases because of all the advantages that Postgres does have. But it's important to understand why people love Couch and Mongo. And it's because it's just effortless to develop an application and start it out. It may not be great when your application gets big, but at least starting out, it's completely effortless. Because you know, documents, they're kind of fun. And SQLs, it's kind of hard. Um, and migrations, like I said before, are you know, a pain to deal with. And, and really, when I started, when I was you know, really into Couch, I realized that most of the applications I was writing, my data wasn't truly relational. I could force it into sort of the relational model, but a lot of times, you know, like I had some nested data that really didn't make sense as another table. It sort of made sense, you know, to be denormalized. And third normalized for me, like it's you know, kind of a pain. And so my, my previous thing that I did with Couch, uh, I had a, an application where people could version their uh, music songs. And so a song, there would be lots of versions 
the song would have a tit one title and you know, a pointer to an artist object. And then it would have an array of versions that the song would go through. Uh, each version, the lyrics had changed, so those were nested under there. Uh, and each version had an array of tracks with individual MP3 files that they would point to. And you know, I could have split that all out and had tables. But then like the individual track table would have to point to the version and the song and the artist. And like it was too much to for me to you know keep in my head all at once. And so having this sort of document structure made a lot of sense at the time. But what does that do with Postgres? I mean Postgres has a bunch of great features. It's a shame to throw them all away just to have some of this document storage. And thankfully, uh, another one like Wally, if you're doing the replication, is a good tool. We, we open sourced it. I think anyone who's running Postgres anywhere near and can get cheap access to Amazon S3, please run this. It'll do the, uh, the wall replication and take care of that for you. But uh, the, this is a project I want to make sure everyone can uh, And the other big, great feature that I missed from Postgres, uh, from relational databases in general, was transactions. Like a lot of, when I had Couch, like I couldn't do updates to more than one document in a transaction. Uh, which was an oak, I was willing to make that trade-off, but it was a regrettable trade-off. Um, but since coming to, back to relational databases and to Postgres, I really missed my document storage. Things, you know, Postgres was great, I liked it, I love it a lot, you know, even today, but it, things, it was just a little more friction than I was used to. But I should say that I, I missed, I don't miss documents anymore because I can use them in Postgres now. And with two things, uh, uh, HStore, which you can use today, uh, it's been around for several versions now, and PLV8 lets you use JSON stuff. I want to touch a little bit on HStore first because it's something that is you know, production ready now, and how to use it to get some of this uh, schemaless stuff in SQL, but then the majority of the talk is going to be on PLV8. So HStore, um, for those of you who haven't used it, it's a key value store in a single column. Uh, and what's really great is you can have expression indexes on uh, individual things. If you notice that one of these things in your key value store you're using a lot, you can go ahead and create an expression index to get that out really fast. And it also has support, fantastic, for um, general indexes where you can do certain, certain things in a general way and get good performance out of it. Um, installing it is super easy if you're on uh, Postgres 9.1 or later. Uh, 9.0, it's easy to do the backslash i and point to the thing, but it's you know, fairly straightforward. Is now that HStore has been around for a while, uh, more uh, newer versions of ORMs are starting to support it. Uh, and the next version of Rails, uh, which is, should be out somewhat soon, has native support out of the box for HStore. And this is fantastic. Uh, we use um, and the, the, way, the way it looks inside is you can just use the contains operator to say, does this, uh, at, like so let's say I have a product table which has a, uh, an adders column that's just in each door. And one of those adders happens to be that the color, you know, different colors of my products. With this in, in Active Record 4, you can say, give me all the ones that are red. And if you want to look more into this, I'm not going to spend too much time on the H door part. Uh, the Postgres documentation is really good. If you want to see an example of the Ruby side with this, uh, one of my colleagues at Roku, Richard Schneeman, has put together a great demo. You can check it out live, and you can check out the code. Um, also, my slides are at uh, plv8- I'll have a link at the end, plv8 If you want to see that. So I encourage everyone to check out this demo. It's good. And um, I personally don't use Active Record that much. I use a different uh, Ruby library called SQL, and this also has support for uh, So one of the ways that we use this to do the H4 at Roku is, so we have lots and lots and lots of Postgres databases. We have to check in on them every so often and see, you know, are you up? How many tables do you have? How many connections? Just like, you know, basic help checks. And we check them, you know, on every database, we check about every 30 seconds. And as we learn more and more about what it takes to have a Postgres service, we realize that some of the questions that we're asking aren't important and we want to stop asking. And other ones we want to start asking. And with, because we store our observations in this H store, I don't have to run a migration on the you know, hundreds of gigabytes of these past observations that we have. 
I can just start tracking these new things and stop tracking the old things and have that sort of shape of the things that I'm recording change over time. And that has worked phenomenally. Uh, another great service, uh, an open source project that another one of my colleagues at Berkeley wrote, uh, Wickle D, lets you can stream structured log streams like this. So if your application emits a log stream, you can have this process hooked up to read the log stream, parse it out, and then store those semi-structured logs in a different Postgres database, sort of you know, asynchronously. And this has been great. We use this for, uh, I'm not sure if it's still the case, but for a little while, all of the billing events on Berkeley went through this sort of thing, where at, some applications were emitting these into a log stream, and this was consuming its stream. Um, but the approach that I like the best is something like this bulk bag approach, uh, where you have your model as it would be normally, you know, in your table, but then you also tack on an HDOR column, or later I'll show you a POV column, where you can just sort of have things that you want to experiment with your application. Uh, you don't really know if you want to commit to, you know, adding a column for it yet, but you can just sort of throw it in this, like, junk drawer table at, junk drawer column at the end. And then if you notice over time that you know, this you know, certain key in HDOR is sticking around for a while, then you can go ahead and promote it to a proper column. Um, unfortunately, we don't do it as much as we should because we, we just like, live with it being in HDOR, and that's actually been OK. Uh, and HDOR is pretty great, but you can't nest HDORs in other HDORs. It's a flat structure only. And the only type you can have for HDOR is strings. And so we developed some sort of like conventions to work around that, where if a key ends in underscore at, we will convert it in our application to a date time. If it starts with num or ends in size, we'll convert it to an integer. Uh, Booleans and question mark, and then just strings for the rest. And that's gotten us pretty far. Um, you know, sometimes you know there's some problems, but all in all, they're easy to work around. And it's been pretty good. And the great thing about HDOR is you can use it today out of I think I don't, I don't know when it started. I think eight three maybe. Um, yeah, yeah. And so it, it's great, and I'm, I'm happy to see that um, in application level, it's been uh, becoming more and more adopted. So now on to the, uh, the main star of the show, uh, so V8 JavaScript engine, and puts it inside Postgres. Uh, it was started by uh, in Japan Toshi Harada, and uh, lately there's been work from Andrew Dunshin and others, and. It uses uh, JavaScript, and you know, some people ask, well, why JavaScript? Well, I mean, it really is a language that's everywhere. Like, everyone's computer has a browser, and it has JavaScript in there. Uh, you can now run JavaScript on server-side with Node, and the, the really great thing about it with Postgres is it's a trusted language. Because JavaScript was always intended to be a language that ran inside other applications, uh, you know, it, it's very well sandboxed, it's, um, and it, it's a perfect choice for having as a PL language. Uh, and the V8 engine itself is kind of nice. It's, uh, for those of you who don't know, they use it, they wrote it for their Chrome browser. And what's really great is it'll compile the, the JavaScript into native code, uh, you know, with a just in time compiler. And it turns out to be uh, It also has a little modern garbage collector and a whole bunch of other bells and whistles that make it a really great choice for being a JavaScript engine. about PLV versus, you know, PL Ruby or PL Python or some of these others. And it really comes down to the fact that uh, mostly the trusted language, and secondly, uh, JavaScript being what it is, is really great for working with JSON. Uh, you can get PLV from uh, Google Code, and uh, installing PLV is pretty easy. Uh, make install, and then you create the extension, and then in your create extension, you create language inside the database. Um, I haven't run into many problems using this. Um, oh, secondly, if you use uh, OS X and you have uh, Postgres.app that Berkeley released, uh, it's a full Postgres thing that comes with PLB already installed for you in Postgres. Uh, so that's a really great way to use PLB. Uh, it's a trivial example, uh, you know, sort of contrived, but I think the, the Fibonacci example sort of is a good showcase for how you might use PLB. Uh, so here's you know a simple naive. Fibonacci sequence in PL SQL. It's real angry, it's all caps and everything. Um, and, you know, but it's naive, I'm not doing any memorization, and, but it does the job. Um, so here it is over the number zero through 35 in terms of five, and it takes uh, a good, like, three minutes, I think that works out to. Um, it takes a while. 
Now let's look at that same function in POV. So we have the same boilerplate, uh, you know, create a replace function, uh, takes an integer, and returns an integer. Uh, but in the middle there, we just have regular JavaScript. And we define a function that does the Fibonacci and then call it with the, the input and return. So let's see how that works. It's much faster. Uh, about 300 milliseconds to do the same line of work. Now, it's sort of not a fair comparison because SQL isn't, procedural SQL isn't, isn't supposed to be a numeric language. But this shows just the speed that V8, once it's compiled, because it's just a compiler, can be really fast. I didn't want to leave it there. I wanted to cheat a little bit and do a memoized version just to see like, exactly how fast it could get it. And you know, this is the same thing. It just creates a, a memoized object and returns it from the, the thing so it's, you know, it doesn't have to do the recursion as much. Um, and it's much better. <coughs> have I tried this using recursive queries in Postgres? I've not. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. Yeah. Like a recursive comment table expression? OK, yeah. Yeah, I've done recursive for the Fibonacci or the Mendelbrot stuff. I haven't done it. That's a, that's a good. That, that would be a better comparison. Thanks. So at the beginning of the talk, I was all excited about documents. So let's let's go back to documents. You know, something more you know, useful than Fibonacci. So let's say I had a, an example document like this. It's sort of like an address book. I have a person. I have. Um, and so I put in, uh, and here, you know, just one column that's a data column, and you know, it's a, a, of a JSON type, and just put them all in. Um, and so let's define a new PLV8 function called get numeric. Now get numeric, it takes a key that you want to get out of your JSON structure, it takes your JSON structure as, as data, and it returns a numeric in Postgres terms. Now all we do is we take the data as it comes in, we parse it into a JavaScript object with a built-in json.parse method, and we just pull out the key and return it. And you can see it working here. Now you do pay a significant cost to doing all this parsing versus, so the top example here is doing it in PLV8. The bottom example is people that only had a numeric column and I was averaging over it. You know, the, the straight regular Postgres you know, is much faster. But when you start doing something a little more complicated, when you start doing you know, huge aggregations, so here's an example where I'm doing the sum, the average, the standard deviation, the min, the max. Um, it's still slower to do all that parsing, but it's not, the, the difference has become much less. Um, and so it's good for those sort of like, you know, more complicated things. Uh, let's, let's see some more examples. Uh, you can do, one of the great things about Postgres is that Postgres doesn't care if you, do an, if you make an index on an expression. It doesn't care that that came from PLV8 versus a built-in function. So it takes a long time to select a count where people are 26 in this example. But if I create an index, it takes a, a long time to create the index. But once it's there, Postgres knows that it can use that index, uses it, and now we're back at regular Postgres. Uh, and that's really exciting. And that's actually the same trade-off that I had when I was developing applications for CouchDB. In Couch, you create a view, a map reduce view in JavaScript. You create it, it takes a long time, but once it's created, it's just a B-tree like Postgres is. It can implement that B-tree, uh, you know, add to it really fast and get the results really fast, but creating that view takes a long time. This is the same trade-off that we have with PLV8 and these expression indexes. It takes a long time to create them, but once it's there, it gets really, really fast. So Postgres has one really great advantage, and that it can bind, it can bind these indices. So here's an example where I use that get numeric thing, that get numeric index. However, I'm combining two different ones, and we can see here that it's using a bitmap join on those two indices, and that's something that it's And what's really, really exciting is that now in Postgres 19, you can have a built-in JSON data. And uh, before, back in the old days of PLV8, you know, like six months ago, I had to you know, worry that if I got bad data in my JSON column, then parsing would uh, blow up. So I'd play some games and create like a domain to check before I put it in here. But now with the JSON data, all that's gone. We have a, a data type in PLV8 together. 
which is good at this. Uh, some other examples of things you might want to do with PLDA is uh, mustache JS. Now, mustache is a lightweight templating engine that has no logic except for like loops and conditionals. And so this is a, a really great pattern. You can go and find JavaScript libraries that does, does what you want. You do the boilerplate, you know, top and bottom for uh, creating a function, and then you just dump in the 400 lines of mustache JS, and then do a little return. And now you have mustache templating inside your Postgres. Uh, and it looks like this. So like, my first argument here is my template. So I have hello, the pound, I want to iterate over all the, the things I have, and period will return the thing, and then you know, end the iteration. And so and then the second one, I pass in some JSON things. It's an array of world from will. And now, when you run that function, you get out the templated response, hello world from will. Now, I don't know if templating like this in your database is useful, but it's kind of cool. A useful library is uh, JSON select. If you go to JSON select, you can see this. It's sort of like XPath or uh, more closely like CSS selectors, but for JSON. So you can describe you know, with one sort of like mini language, how to get things in your JSON structure. The same sort of pattern, uh, JSON select was made to work either in the browser with uh, jQuery or to work in Node.js. And Node.js has this like exports thing. So in this function, I have a boilerplate on the top and bottom. And then I sort of pretend that I'm a Node.js module. So I create an empty exports module, paste in the JSON select code, which is long and complicated, and then in the bottom here, I take the JSON that comes in, in the, uh, data, the data argument, parse it into an object, pass that and the selector into the match function that the JSON selector has, and return that. And so this is a function that takes the selector, takes the JSON, and returns the JSON subset that you asked for. And so, yeah. <coughs> So uh, the, uh, the comment was that now PLB has a startup function that you can preload code, so you don't have to do the pasting. I did see that, but I haven't had time to actually play with it myself. I was very excited to do it, but I didn't make any time to talk about it. Thank you. Um, and so let's go back to the, the documents that I have, just as a reminder. So here's, uh, I have uh, this dentist here is the, the first person. And what you can do with JSON Select is you can say like, okay, now I want out of my table of people, I want the name from the, the first the first name in case there's more than one name attribute, and I want all of their phone numbers as phone, and then you select that and you get it all out nice as you found in your your target list, and that's really nice. Um, we don't have to have that one-off get you American. We can just do JSON select age and cast that to an integer do the same, the same thing. So now, instead of all these arbitrary one-off functions, we can just have JSON select that does all of them. And so, and that, that's the last like, useful thing. Uh, the, the bad idea, that's pretty nice, is uh, what if you had a function that took arbitrary JSON or JavaScript code, you valid it inside a function that immediately executed it. Uh, then you can do things like this. You can select, uh, return, say, select, multiply these two large numbers, and base 36 them into the word JavaScript. Uh, I have a second, I didn't, I didn't show it, but I have a second version of that, of that argument that has a different signature that takes in JSON and parses it and puts it in as an argument. So you can have an arbitrary one-off run of your things. That's one, one, one of the um, unfortunate things is that do blocks are PLC only. Really? There's some, there's, there, was, there was some limitation that, that you can't have like a return value. That's, yeah, you can't have, yeah, that's, that's what it is. Um, which is unfortunate. Like, if you could have anonymous functions that you could do that have return values, that'd be great. Um, in the meantime, you can, use, if you, you can use this to have your JavaScript and SQL injection. Um, 
So I wanted to take all these. Looked into it yet, but I, like my gut tells me that the index only scan would have done. Because um, I, I don't think at that, I mean, I, I don't know, but I don't think at that level that Postgres cares where it came from. If it can look at the index, and, and the tricky thing is you have to have the query be exactly the same because for, for Postgres to know to use that index, like one of the problems I had with HStore is that um, the arrow operator for HStore is, uh, you know, the, the other name for it, uh, I can't think of it get value, um, even though it just always evaluates the error operator evaluates back to get value. Um, the, if you define your index on the arrow versus the, the name, uh, you have to query it the same exact way. It won't know to capitalize the, yeah. Um, which is annoying to find out, but once you know it, I guess you can deal with it. Um, so, so I recommend everyone check out this application. It's running. Uh, you can check out the source code. Um, and all it is is a simple app to help me uh, be better at my daily standups. So I can know what I said I hoped I would do in the past so I can track to see if I can actually get around to doing that. Um, and so but my main motivation really wasn't the, the app. It was just to, I really wanted to see. I had this idea that you know, if I have JavaScript everywhere, you know, like, that, that could be pretty neat to have JavaScript in my database, in the application server, and in the front end. And I wanted to see, like, is that actually useful or not? And I wanted to see what went well, and you know, just as importantly, what didn't go well. Uh, I first started exploring through all the, like, the JavaScript frameworks, because I hadn't really paid attention to them for a while. Things have gotten crazy. Um, there's, I found a really, uh, this one meteor, which, uh, unfortunately, has like a strong tie to MongoDB. The other one, Derby, which is more database agnostic. I looked into Derby, and it's it's really neat. Uh, when you're running it and you change your file and save it, the server notices it and then sends the new template down to your browser over WebSockets, and it just like changes live, which is you know really like G Wiz neat. Um, and I feel sort of hypocritical saying that it kind of feels like too much magic being a Rails developer, but. Um, so maybe, you know, maybe it's promising, but for the purposes of this application, like, it, it wasn't, um, the benefits it had versus the trade-offs of it being you know, very new and uh, you know, sort of hard to understand wasn't worth it for this application. But maybe it'll be uh, promising in the future. Uh, and so Stack I sort of settled on is Backbone.js, which gives you sort of easy models and serialization from the browser on the client side. Uh, Node.js for the server, and normally I, I wouldn't build something in Node, but to sort of do something on this idea of JavaScript everywhere, I thought you know, I had to choose it. And database, of course, Postgres and uh, And what was really nice is starting this way, starting with the client. Like I had maybe 10 ideas of apps I wanted to build. Starting just with the client, HTML and JavaScript, no server, no database, I was able to really quickly like go through several of the ideas and see what was promising. And you know, I used the HTML5 local storage. Uh, Instead, of, instead, and it was um, really great to not have to worry about for the first time in a long time servers or databases. Um, but really quickly, I realized I needed to start. I didn't have read, but I could start modeling API calls. And what was a really interesting pattern I stumbled upon was modeling my database as an in-memory cache. When I restarted the server, it would go away. But for just trying something out, it was really great. And so I just here had a list of objects that had a UUID, because I sort of was cheating and I knew I wanted to use UUIDs in Postgres. Um, and you know, just a simple description of the thing I said I hoped I would do. Um, and the API was really simple. Uh, getting it, I would just take that list, JSONify it, and send it on down. When I added a new item to the list, I would give it a UUID and stick it in there. And this allowed me to you know, sort of have something in place that just did the API. But then it was time to add Postgres. 
perspective of how simple things have been. So I just, uh, it's like, what's the simplest thing I could do? And I figured, you know, POV8, uh, UUID, OSSP, which is unfortunate because a hyphen, you need to double quote it, and you're not really going to do that. Uh, it's awful. But uh, that's how you would add many IDs. Uh, I created a simple table that had. Um, Uh, and what, what? Adding some small features to the app. And so when I started out, I just had the description. You know, I, one of the things I hope to do today is get my phone. But then I realized, using a The way I did it was just on the client side. In backbone when it made a new one, just give it the new date. I didn't have to, this is all it took to add dates. I didn't have to change my application server. I didn't have to change anything. I didn't have to add a copy. I didn't have to run to remember to run. Another thing I wanted to describe was how many times I'd bump something to the next day. Just to see like if I'm doing this a lot, maybe it's time to ask for help with this. Maybe it's time to investigate, like, maybe there's some external blockers I need to work on. And so the same thing, a little more complicated, was just to add a, a default of zero times it's been bumped and just increment. But again, this is the same sort of case where I just changed it on the client side, and I didn't have to worry about anything outside. I pushed the new code to Heroku. I didn't run any migrations. It just all worked really magically. Uh, the interesting one, I realized that other people wanted to use it instead of just me, so I needed to add some sort of authentication. And we use uh, Google Auth for everything, so if you have a, a, an app broker domain email address, you can get in. Um, and so I added Google Auth, I found a library that just did this. And when you have it in Node, it adds a, uh, a user object to the request, and then you can get you know, some identification out from that. And so the only thing it took to add user authentication to this app was only in, the only place I had to touch was Node.js. I didn't have to touch the client side. I didn't have to, well, to add a link to the login. But I didn't have to touch Postgres to start adding the concept of users since I was just storing the ID on this column, on this, in this JSON block. When you made a new hope, it would uh, just put your user ID, just slip it in there, and then you know everything else was the same. To get them back out, I had JSON select. And so I just said, instead of select all for hopes, I would select just the ones that had that user ID. And that was it. That's all I had to do to add user authentication. And all of this was, was really easy to do. And it was the first time, I have to be honest, that things have felt effortless since coming back to relational databases. And that, that to me was like really exciting. Like now I finally can, I don't have to feel bad about you know, recommending people use Postgres for really small apps. Uh, one of the things I see um, you know, in blog posts and stuff are things like, I, I saw recently um, this blog post where this guy like, made this interesting service, and you know, it was all stateless, so it didn't have anything. But then in the end of the comments, you know, where it was wrapping up the blog post, it's like, you know, if you wanted to store this, you could easily just add a new SQL database. And there you go. Like, I see where he's coming from, because that is easier than having to run all these migrations. But this is, is really exciting to me, because now we can, as Postgres, we can offer that experience. Um, show off the uh, benefits of having semi-structured data versus just the flat like page store. But that really isn't the point. The point, I mean, that, that's useful, yes, but the point is that this makes developing applications so much easier. And the, the two ways I think it works is the bulk bag, junk drawer, column approach I discussed earlier, and these sort of one-off key value or key data tables. Um, because when you keep everything real simple, you can develop your, your ideas for you know, small applications really quickly. And the real point is when you start with Postgres, you're going to be better off later on should this thing grow. Um, you know, and we all know this, you know, being you know, here at the Postgres conference. But I mean, there's a lot of great features in Postgres that you can take advantage of later. Like one of the things I could easily see myself doing is, you know, should this actually you know, be anything important more than just a demo app, uh, I would split out the date column to be a proper date, you know, so I could take advantage of all the date, you know, times, times the key Z functions that Postgres has. 
I could use range types to see, like, show me the things I said I wanted to do a model. Um, and if I went with, I, I don't want to say reverse database, younger database, I wouldn't have the option to do that. And so it's, I think this is really great to get people who use Postgres for even smaller apps that they wouldn't have thought they needed all the weight of a big range of database. But the biggest success I found happening in using this approach was that there was this really strong impedance match between all of the layers of the application. Um, I was using the same model everywhere, so I could have mental overhead of switching languages, of switching contexts between things, because often I could get the job done in one instead of all three of the tiers. And you know, just having my model be the same way throughout the application. But when I realized that, it was sort of troubling to me, because I always took it as truth that the way you want to build your application is to have well-defined tiers that only uh, talk, give support to the tier above them and use the tier below them uh, you know, as, as you know, the way to build you know, applications. But like, I saw so much benefit from having the same model I tried to, you know, I thought about it a lot. And I think this is the way was the sort of the, the thing. The, it was mostly a failure. Like I didn't really see a whole lot of ways that I could effectively share code between all the tiers, except for one really great way. And that was with the validation tier. And so we're already saved from being able to get bad JSON into, into your column, because if you try to insert something that's not JSON into the JSON data type, It'll give you an error of like, why wow, it's bad, and we'll let you insert it. That's great. But what about bad data? Were I using, a, you know, were I using Postgres normally, like, and I tried to insert something that wasn't an integer into my integer column, you know, Postgres wouldn't let me do that. But here, if I tried to insert something that was not a number from a bump count, uh, it just gets inserted. And then now I have, you know, bad data, bad representation of the thing. And that's, you know, kind of sad. And so, on the server, you can stop it by, you know, before you, you know, before you save something to the database, you can go through a series of checks. And so, I have a, a thing in the application where it just runs through a couple checks, like, is the date present? Is the description present? Is the, is the description in between this range? Is the bump count positive? And if it's not, it'll return a, a string. And if the thing that uses that method, if it returns anything but undefined, it'll show that message to the user. Uh, and what was great, you know, I was doing, you know, instinctually, is that was in, you know, CoffeeScript. I can convert it to JSON and send it down, and Backbone.js has, or sorry, in the JavaScript. And Backbone.js has the same API for validations, and so I could avoid the round trip. But you still have the problem of, you know, if you're, you know, you know doing some migrations manually, you could still easily get bad data. But here's something that's awesome. Watch this. You just wrap it around with the PLBA function. Uh, you have the raw JSON come in, you parse it as an object, and then you um, run uh, the check model. If it's not undefined, you don't let it in. You have that function returns true or false. And then you add a check constraint. And so now, anytime I insert data into this table, it'll run that check constraint, and it won't let bad data in. And so the first one, bump, bump count as a string, it doesn't let it in, but a, a fully proper hope with all the different fields, it lets that in. And that was really good. Like, this was, um, you, it was the only thing I could think of that showed it, but this was actually really useful for me because once I was started migrating stuff manually by hand, I was safe, I saved myself from the sort of screen something. And what's interesting is about the same time as I was doing this, uh, the SQL project in Ruby started doing uh, a similar thing where it would put check constraints in the database and add a metadata column. 
And then when your application boots up, SQL reads the metadata column and then adds those validations at runtime to your objects as before save them. And so even though it's not job the same exact function everywhere, um, other things are catching on on this uh, you know, way to have validations, the same validations in more than one place. Um, so in closing, what we have here is developer-friendly documents, but in a, a world-class database, which is really awesome. Um, and the first time, we have a data type and a PO language that are really you know, meant for each other out of the box. And that's really exciting. Uh, I think I'm going to start working on an extension that you know, depends on PLV8 that has you know, sort of, you know, a couple of these functions built in, and then another function that will create that sort of key value table for you. Because people should, like, it took me, uh, when I was coming to Postgres, I had this uh, just save that was pretty funny, where I kept trying to create a table and I couldn't figure out the syntax. Like, I know it now, you know, it's easy to know now. It's hard to look up. I'm sure you can look it up. It's difficult, it's harder than it should be. Like, if we know people are going to use it this key value store, you know, like this, there could just be one thing that creates it for you. And that would uh, really reduce the barrier to entry and get, uh, you know, more things going. Uh, so I think that combined with, uh, yeah, I think, I think that'd be uh, My sort of wish list uh, is more native storage for JSON, right? Now it's just stored as uh, text, I believe. If you could figure out a binary storage, like, that would be really nice. Um, one of the things that, that happens a lot is, like, my check constraint, if I had two of them, it would you know, reparse the JSON both times. Um, I, I don't know how, but like, if we could somehow store the memory object of, Postgres, of the JSON, so to eliminate the reparsing of JSON all the time, that would be pretty nice. Um, a general index would be great. Um, tree extension, you could sort of, you know, Emulate one. Is the JSON select? I, I should have put it in the slide. I forgot to. But, um, it's expensive. And Postgres will, even if you have it as an index, it will rerun it um, when it doesn't need to, just because it thinks it's cheap like other functions. So Postgres, you can sort of define the function cost. And once I bumped it up, it um, would eliminate running the function again, which is great. Um, it would be nice if Postgres saw that the function was expensive. And the cost. Um, and if we could have Postgres speak REST, like Couch does, I could have gotten rid of Node altogether and so I'm to Postgres, which would be pretty good. Well, thanks.